All right, now we're going to talk with Jacob Barnhart, audiovisual engineer at UC Davis. He's had a front row seat to see how the Davis team goes about selecting and installing AV systems across the entire campus. He's going to speak with us today about their recent renovations at Young Hall, as well as how the campus is managing upgrades during these COVID times. All right, we got Jacob Bernhardt from UC Davis joining us from uh, his new classrooms of the future. Jacob, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at UC Davis? Sure, I am an AV engineer here at UC Davis. I uh, am a, one of three engineers that we have. Uh, we design all of our general assignment classrooms and provide uh, tier three repair services. Very cool. So can we talk a little bit about the recent renovations you guys did at Young Hall? Uh, what led the school to determining this hall needed renovation? Sure. So we have a construction management team, design and construction management, and they look at, uh, they get money from the registrar to renovate these classrooms and they select which classrooms need renovation based on the age, the use, the building longevity, and um, <clears throat> kind of like what rooms the uh, registrar needs in terms of classroom size. Um, for example, we have a handful of rooms that are on a do not resuscitate list because the building is very old. Um, this building is old, but it's not planned to be decommissioned anytime soon. I'm talking specifically about Young Hall, um, and it's a heavily used room. Uh, one of the other challenges we have uh, prior to COVID, obviously, was these rooms are in such heavy use that we get a very short window to get in there and actually renovate them. So we have about 136 general assignment classrooms. We're building a few more buildings currently, so that room's gonna go up. And these are the, the types of rooms that we are um, in charge of general assignments this is undergraduate classrooms. And the registrar selected four rooms in Young Hall, one of which is a large lecture hall, holds about 300 people, and it is under heavy, heavy use for uh, hard sciences, undergraduate hard sciences. So that was the largest room they selected. And then there's three other rooms adjacent to them, uh, to that room. One is medium, a uh, little less than 100, and the other are what we would consider small classrooms, which is um, 15 to 35 or 40. Um, rooms. And so these rooms haven't really been touched um, for a long time. The building was built in the 60s and a lot of the acoustic treatment and the ceiling and the air conditioning systems, all, the, all that stuff was original. It had a couple AV refreshes, but because they didn't tear everything else down, we're talking latched panduit on top of latched panduit and just band-aids everywhere. So this was a complete renovate, gut the walls, new ceilings, new chairs, new furniture, new floors, everything. So um, we did 16 rooms this summer. We did four in Young Hall and we did 12 in Wellman. The four in Young Hall are larger and required a little bit more um, uh, high touch than the other project we did. Very cool. So with that many spaces, you've got to get a lot of planning out of the way. How did you go about planning the redesign and selecting the vendors? Can you describe how the bid process went? Sure. So our, um, our, our hit the ground running date is when spring uh, quarter finishes, which is uh, early, early June. And so we start designing a select, we try to get what rooms we're going to do way back in um, December. Uh, and then we start designing um, what displays we're gonna use in that room. We have a, a core architecture that we um, use in most of the GAC spaces. Then we deviate from it depending on the size of the room, maybe gets a different sound system. Um, but most of the gear uh, is pretty similar room to room. Obviously things like the desk size and the projection screens and that sort of thing are a little different. So we um, put together drawing packages and parts lists. And then there are, well, this wasn't a formal bid because we have a, U, the UCOP has a contract with four contractors that we're allowed to select from and key code is one of them. So we put together our design packages for both buildings and we got proposals from all four uh all four contractors and um 
our our decisions were selected by price, our relationship with that contractor, that contractor's track record, and how involved they were in the design process. How communicative were they? How much back and forth do we have? And how how involved were they in the design process? Very cool. So in that design process, you're making technology decisions. So what tech projectors and systems were included in that final design and why? So for projection um, uh, devices, we use uh, Panasonic lasers uh, for flat screens. We typically in these uh, medium sized rooms use 86 inch NEC um, commercial displays. And if we need smaller stuff, we usually go with Samsung uh, commercial um, digital signage displays. Um, and the reason we do that is most of our decisions are based off of reliability and longevity. We don't want to be on the cutting or bleeding edge of technology because once these rooms are in use, they're in use from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m., uh, six to seven days a week and there's no real time for us to get in there to fix anything if we have a failure um, besides after hours or on sometimes on weekends so we really are um, taking a long-term approach in the support of these rooms and so we don't go out and buy the brand new whiz bang thing with fun features that aren't fully vetted. And we have a test lab where we'll buy stuff and test it thoroughly and vet it and make sure that we, if there are failure modes, we know what they are. We know how to support it before we go and deploy a whole bunch of these systems. So um, we recently made the, a couple of years ago, we made the change to um, laser phosphor uh, projectors because our repair team no longer has to run around and do bulbs, but we weren't jumping on the laser um, bandwagon. The second they came out, we waited, you know, for them to be true, tried and true. And we, we've had good luck with uh, Panasonic. Very cool. So it sounds like there were some key decisions there that um, led to implementation success. Do you think there were any other decisions that were in that process that led to a very successful project for you guys? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so we have um, experience with our design team, uh, the, the architects that work on stuff. And uh, from our experience, we know that they sometimes change their mind uh, about things like the ceiling height at the last minute. So we've um, gone ahead and kind of standardized on some flexible uh, solutions. So uh, things like adjustable pole mounts for the projectors and the TV. So if they change the ceiling height, we can... Uh, accommodate that and for almost all overhead support we try to put larger pieces of unistrut in than what you would typically see that way we have a lot of flexibility to move things around um, if they decide they want the screen bigger and then we have to relocate the projector or so forth and um, also some of these buildings have um, some overhead uh, issues like um, we have uh, a, one building that has honeycombed ceiling concrete that was really popular in the 60s for acoustic reasons, but that gives you a very small amount of real estate to put uh, concrete anchors in the ceiling. So having longer um, pieces of strut give you the ability to uh, tag it in multiple places. Uh, the good thing about our standardized uh, classroom systems moving forward uh, is all, everything we did in this classroom matches the other lecture halls we've done. So the instructor experience is pretty seamless going from room to room, which is kind of what we're going for. The uh, GUI and the look and feel of the room is almost identical to everything else. One change we did have uh, this summer is we selected a different instructor's desk. We've been getting a lot of requests to have a smaller desk in the smaller spaces that is not as deep. And so the um, architect can fit more seating in that room. Uh, and so we have, um, for the many years gone with a mid Atlantic, uh, sit stand and we now, uh, are trying out a spectrum, uh, industries, um, piece of furniture. And so besides the desk change, all the other equipment is identical. The dot cams identical, the confidence monitors identical, the input and outputs are the same. Uh, the touch panel and the GUI is the same. However, the code base behind the, uh, touch panel and uh, all of the um, Crestron code is uh, brand new, but um, on the front end, it's identical. Awesome. I mean, it's always great when you can cut and paste uh, any config, and our friends from Crestron were talking about that just a little while ago, and doing that in the design process, that just makes that whole, whole part go simpler. 
How are you using Crestron there at UC Davis? So we've standardized on um, a while ago now, I think five, six years ago on uh, HDBase-T. We're using DM um, matrices in all of our classrooms. We're using eight by eights in our classrooms and in most of our lecture halls, we have 16 bys because we have uh, more um, outputs. And uh, we have CP3Ns in all the rooms and um, 10 inch uh, touch panels. And so we're, we're pretty much a, he we're a pretty heavy user of Crestron on campus. We have uh, an on-prem uh, fusion server that our tier one support team can uh, monitor and do uh, calls, uh, a C a service calls um, from any device. They can control the rooms. Um, our lecture capture team uses fusion to remotely um, change their audio feeds. So we have a discrete uh, feed for all their lecture equipment and they can um, make modifications to uh, volume adjustments without affecting anything in the room. And they can do this all remotely from um, their studio. Um, yeah, we are, we have one room with NVX uh, in it and we had some on-campus challenges with our uh, network operations center. Um, we're still exploring uh, AV over IP solutions, but unfortunately, our, uh, our our data center works uh, even slower than we do and even more securely than we do. So again, we're not on the bleeding edge of technology in any regard. There's always challenges with, with any install. Now, given that it's 2020, um, how did the challenge of COVID impact your timeline and the installation process? So yeah, this, this happened kind of right when we were starting uh, our installation, um, we, Everyone on campus uh, that could um, was sent home to work from home. Um, engineers that had critical on-campus things or support teams, uh, we had a relaxed uh, or reduced on-campus presence. So we're here, I'm here today, uh, one day a week, and I kind of alternate with my colleagues on who's covering. Uh, obviously, if there's an emergency, we'd come in right away. Um, when the construction started, we had just kind of surveys for everyone coming on campus. Um, the restrictions for on-campus presence got um, a lot more heavy-handed after um, uh, Key Code finished. We now have um, testing weekly if you're on campus and a daily survey um, if you come to campus. But um, actually, the uh, COVID um, impacted this job site in an interesting way because the classes that were planned on happening in these rooms were all canceled. So the uh, handover date of occupancy kind of slid to whatever is convenient for people because no one was going to be really using the room. There, for a second, we thought we, they were going to have some emergency overflow stuff in the rooms, but then the uh, campus decided that we're not going to have any in-person uh, classes, at least for that fall quarter. Um, so our deadlines did slide a little bit. And that presented some other challenges because other trades um, took their time on things, which, you know, trickle down to everybody having to kind of work around that. So there was some logistical scheduling stuff. Um, one of the main factors that COVID uh, really hit us was we were really concerned about uh, supply chain on getting the inventory of the electronics. Uh, a lot of stuff was back ordered. A lot of stuff was not uh, accessible or um, uh, manufacturing um, was impacted. So we really pushed hard once we got, once we selected uh, our contractors to get all the equipment purchased and ordered as soon as possible. Um, because the second COVID hit, all of the other campuses started doing uh, hybridized or, or remote um, classes and things like webcams, you, you know, everything was uh, completely back ordered. So we did really push hard to try and get all of our equipment in on time. And almost all of it came in on time. We had a couple straggling things here and there, but it, it all worked out. So, Jacob, thanks for taking the time today to sit down and talk with us about your experiences. And I uh, hope you guys have a great school year and we can all get back into these rooms <laughs> waiting for everybody as quickly as we can. Yeah, we're all looking forward to getting back to normalcy and seeing the campus full of students. Uh, until then, we're just kind of making things happen. Awesome sauce. Thanks again and uh, have, a great, have a great rest of the day. Okay, you too. Thank you. Thank you.